Um, so yes, I'm Monica Pair. I'm the design director for product at JW Player. I oversee product designers and front end engineers. So we have two disciplines on the team, which gives us an incredible advantage. Let me just try to get rid of that. Not now. Um, so I'd be curious, actually, who in the audience has actually heard of JW Player? Familiar with them at all? What we do? Awesome. Um, so that's a pretty, let's say, 40, 60 split there. Who knows us? Um, so what we do, a little bit of background, is we're a video player technology. So we work with the player UI. And then we also have a dashboard that has a lot of other features involved with it, like analytics, uh, content management, recommendations. There's a lot to really go into. Um, so that's a little bit of context, and it'll kind of play out as I, as I talk through this concept of crafting a data-driven design process. So I won't have GIFs, so just set your expectations just the way that Zach did. Um, but what I will talk about is the experience that I've had building and crafting this data-driven design process that didn't exist when I started at JW Player about three and a half years ago. So I, I want to try to share practical experience that we have. You can read, there's a ton of Medium articles about what data-driven design is, but I really want to kind of get into the details as to how do you actually implement it, how do you get buy-in, how do you go from A to B, and have a successful process for this. So what is data-driven design? I can explain that pretty quickly. It's the process of optimizing products based on things you can measure. Quantitative data is gathered and used to inform decisions about our designs. So we really want to pursue data-driven design because we want to have a process for not just informing decisions around our own design, but giving our product managers, for instance, data to make decisions overall. So why do you want to be data-driven as a designer? Everybody wants to be data-driven as a designer today. Uh, simply, there are things you cannot know without data. And I'll, I'll go into a couple examples, very specific to what we do at JW Player, so you can kind of get a, a really good understanding as to how this applies to a very specific business model. So our first example is how many users see or interact with our product in a given time period. So we talked about how JW Player is a video technology. We have a metric of half a billion video plays a day. So this is a pretty high number. What this means is releasing a change or an update to the design of a product or feature can either optimize or disrupt the experience for a large number of our users. So when you think about that large metric on a given day, we have 185, million, 185 billion views a year, but on a given day, we have half a billion. That introduces a lot of risk, and you really need to understand the impact that that's going to have on your users. You don't want to disrupt the experience for them. You always want to be optimizing. But when you mature to a, level, a threshold of consumption for your product, it's really important to understand that impact. So example number two, what percentage of our users consume video on mobile versus desktop? So this is a pretty basic question. A lot of companies ask themselves this. Everybody understands the, the split between your users on mobile and, and desktop. But for us at JW Player, you know, we look at a high-level metric like 40% on mobile versus 60% on desktop. Break that down by our publisher, and you can see publisher one and two have a pretty similar split. It's, it's to be expected. We're looking at about, you know, 50-50 or 40-60 for phone versus desktop. And then you look at publisher number three, and you, it's skewed entirely towards mobile devices. That's going to open up a ton more questions for us as designers. What opportunity does that open up? What should we be thinking about that publisher's video strategy? Why are they getting so much traffic on mobile devices? And it's something to be incredibly aware of, essentially. And that's something that we wouldn't know without the data. So how do you go from being a sayer to a doer of data-driven design? This is a, something that I love, because my team specifically, we're not sayers, we're doers. We really think about how do we get from talking about how to implement a process to actually implementing the process. First, you need to understand the different approaches for gathering the right type of data for your products. So at JW Player, we use all of, all of these different approaches. Surveys, we look at that to talk to our customer base to figure out what is the priority for our, our product roadmap for the year. 
Uh, that's something that is anecdotal information that we can get directly from our customers. Customer research and user testing. That's something that we lean on really heavily for our dashboard. We really want to talk to the specific customers, understand their pain points, understand their workflows, what their strategies are, and really get some, some of that quantitative but also qualitative data. Then A-B testing. This is something that we just recently started implementing with something like our video player. So that involves a little bit of prototyping. It, it involves a little bit more strategic cross-team uh, coordination to get that in front of many users and to get data back. Site analytics, that's pretty straightforward. A lot of websites obviously need to understand the site traffic that's coming back. You're using tools like Google Analytics, something like an Optimizely. And then internal data, that's something for us more specifically. You can look at, let's say, the volume of our support tickets and understand where are, the, where are there specifically pain points in the dashboard, pain points with our video player, what are people having issues, what are bugs that are coming back to us. So that's something to be aware of. It's going to be a little bit different for everyone's company. This is very specific, you know, an approach that we have or our perspective as to how we look at the data. So next, so I'm going to talk very specifically from that list, A-B testing and prototyping designs for our video player. I want to talk about this because this is something we have most recently have figured out how to implement and get buy-in across the company, figure out what the data is going to look like, who are all your key players. So I'll dive into this more specifically. So we really like to ask a lot of whys with my team. So why do we want to A-B test? Why do we want to prototype our features first? So one of the key things is design measurement. There isn't really any way to understand the impact of your design without having some sort of data points coming back to you. We want to understand our various user personas. So like I showed you, there's, there's a split between mobile and desktop devices. We want to understand why certain users are coming to a certain site or a publisher through mobile and why certain are coming through desktop. We want to quickly and continuously optimize for our users. And then lastly, we want to isolate and understand the impact of a product feature. So tying back to that really scary number where you get half a billion users a day, or half a billion plays a day, that's something where we really need to be mindful as to what is that impact that we're going to have when we release a product or a feature. So next, create a buzz for the buy-in. So this is where you're going to really need to engage leadership. You're going to want to figure out who your key stakeholders are. You're going to want to really like do a grassroots essential, like from the ground up, let's figure out who is going to help us get this process done. So you assemble your dream team. So who are your key players in the game of data-driven decision making and design? So pretty straightforward, your product managers, they're your visionaries. You want their long-term vision. You want to understand what problems they want to solve for the users. And you have designers and front-end engineers. They're your problem solvers. This, I'll be very transparent, we're at an advantage at JW Player where my team is comprised of designers and front-end engineers, which means I don't have to try very hard to get buy-in from engineers. If we really have a project we want to pursue on the design side, there are advocates. So this might not be the case at every company, so that's something to be aware of. But that tight collaboration is super important. Then we have QA, our quality gatekeepers. They are a team that you really want to have a lot of trust from, because if we're aiming to ship and deliver features fast to our users, we want them to trust us that we're not going to break anything in our video player. We're not going to impact the uh, quality of our products negatively. And then data science, your analysts, we need a really tight partnership there. We need them to give us insights as to what we're, get, what we're getting back as data. And we want them to also identify opportunities where product can optimize for our users. So that's a tight collaboration there between all four of these different departments, so cross-team, cross-functional. This is your dream team. This is who you really need to get buy-in. So we have, we want to be able to uh, engage our leadership in this, uh, in this concept of data-driven design. So you're really, what you're trying to do is push through something in, in terms of your product development process that they might see as slowing down the process. They want to ship fast. We want to say, let's take a step back. Let's think about what we're building. Let's think about why. 
what are the problems we want to solve. But the way that you get this buy-in directly from leadership is you tie this back to strategic company goals. So you get real organized real fast. So you got to create an experimentation roadmap. This is where we get into the details. So you want to run a test. We have something like a feature that we wanted to test with recommendations on pause. We have a set of, uh, we have a recommendations algorithm. We really want to increase engagement with our users over a single watch session. So you have to have a hypothesis. That ensures that you actually have a problem that you're solving. So our hypothesis here would be showing view viewers recommended videos during the pause state of the player will increase engagement during a single watch session. That's our hypothesis. Don't know what the answer will be. We can be wrong, and that's OK. But we have the, we have the problem that we're trying to solve. So then you have a test length. We wanted to run this for over a seven-day period, so one week. And then targeting. And this is where it gets really specific, too, to what your company is and what its strategic goals are, what type of business strategy you have. Because if you look at this, we wanted to target 50% of our of users across 10 publishers that had an enterprise player edition. So you're looking at a percentage of a percentage of our user base. And then experimentation types. You want to think about what type of experiment are you running. You need to understand what that data is going to come back and look like. So this was a multivariate test, which essentially meant we had a lot of variables we were going to introduce to the scenario. It wasn't going to be an apples to apples. You know that going in. We do do apples to apples A-B testing, but there will be certain opportunities where we know we're going to have to completely disrupt our UI to really achieve a goal that we're, we're after. And then KPIs, this is where you get really into, I'm speaking directly to our CEO at this point, where I'm saying, you have a key performance indicator that you're measuring our team against, which is increased click rates, increase, increase play rates. And there might be more. There might be inc increased engagement during watch sessions. So that's something that's super key for us, kind of having our eye on the ball as to like what is our KPIs, what are our measurements, what is going to resonate with our CEO. So before you get started, so you have your experiments, you have your list. Some things to be aware of, prototyping and A-B testing are not a one-size-fits-all process. You really do have to understand that even what I'm telling you today isn't going to fit directly into your business model, how your teams are structured, what you're trying to achieve. So you really need to be a little bit flexible in terms of understanding how to take a process and really implement it for your team. So understand what your, your, what your own unique use cases are and what tools your team needs to execute. So what, your tool, what tools your team needs to execute. We had a conversation in-house with the design team and we really wanted to pursue A-B testing. We really thought about it. We were like, what tools aren't at our disposal right now? What's preventing us from being able to experiment, to prototype, to validate our designs really fast, to really manipulate our own UI and see how it all plays out. So we thought about, what do we need? We need a way to click, quickly iterate on designs and test user interactions without the complex back-end functionality of our player technology. So we basically have an insanely technical, complex technical video player. There's a lot of things that, personally, I don't need to be aware of. We have adaptive streaming. We have ads in our, in our video player. We have playback rate functionality. There's a lot there. And that's a lot that my team doesn't really need to be aware of. So we really thought about, how do we build our own tools? So enter our own prototyping framework, our player UI viewer, that very affectionately within my team is known as SME. I will explain why. So internally, we decided we wanted to build some of our own design tools. So that's something that we're constantly thinking about. How do you, how do you become more efficient with design? So we already had a product called Hook, which is our design framework for unifying style and branding across products. The more professional name being our site's commons library. So that's Hook. It hooks into everything we do. We had Tinkerbell, which is our rapid prototyping collection and experimentation toolkits professionally known as our sandbox, and then SME, which is our prototyping for the player UI and interaction. So this is how we just have a little bit of fun with the things that we build internally. And I would love to say that everybody calls our prototyping framework player UI viewer. They actually call it SME. So 
it's caught on. <laughs> so what is this player UI viewer? So this is a, a screenshot essentially of a product that we built internally. Our front end engineer really took a lot of design feedback from our, design, our product designer and we really isolated some features that we wanted to have that would help us click, quickly iterate. So we wanted this ability to be able to toggle between different states of our player. We wanted to isolate certain interactions with our player. We wanted to really understand uh, what, our, what our player looked at, very diff at specific player dimensions. So we have multiple breakpoints. You know how that goes when you're working with responsive design. We really needed a way to kind of work through a lot of those scenarios really fast. And then what we wa also wanted was we wanted to be able to sideload these experiments. So if you see at the bottom, we have a way to load in a certain A-B test that we want. And then we've built this in a way that this could be shared internally. We can share it with our product managers. We can share it with our CEO. So if there's any questions about what are we testing, we have a way to do that and have that transparency. So now that we have our prototyping framework, we created a multivariate test. So A being our shelf, and B being our existing overlay that shows users more videos. Essentially the same concept in a different design presentation. So it's multivariate, you could see how many things are different between the two different designs. You have a minimal, the shelf being a minimal, less intrusive experience, and then you have an overlay that's a, a takeover that essentially if someone pauses and wants to browse more, they're kind of exiting from that playback experience and they're seeing more videos to keep engaging. Or our shelf, which is if they pause it and they get more videos, they're not really jumping out of that watch experience. So we put it in our prototyping framework. So this is an example of what this looks like. So we have our shelf that actually one of the things that was really beneficial for having a prototyping framework for this was what are the UI conflicts that we're going to have? So I don't, if, it might be a little bit tricky to see, but our volume slider, for instance, was something that was going to overlap with our player. We have a settings menu that's going to overlap with our player. We wanted to really think about what are transitions, what are the levels in terms of like depth of UI, what's going to overtake when you, when you have that shelf open and you interact with something else in the player. So we really were able to make a lot of desi design decisions on the fly working with a front-end engineer in this system that was completely decoupled from a lot of complex functionality. We didn't have to deal with engineering sprints. You know how long those take? Those are two weeks out. Um, we were just able to get a lot of buy-in as to like what this product could be and if we wanted to pursue it. And the other benefit that we had is, of course, where you're talking about our player rendering at many different widths. We cannot predict what our publishers are going to do with our player when it lands on their site. We don't know what, what player widths they're going to put it at. A lot of our players are actually out in the wild as very tiny players. So being able to have a framework that we could test and show this will, will this actually work at that, at that presentation that the, our publisher is going to put it in is really important for us. So we passed it off. We, we run the test for seven days. You get it analyzed by data. They do a lot of their data magic. You get something like this back. They share all of this with us. Doesn't mean a whole lot to me, but they do give us initial findings, and we do get to take, we do get some takeaways from this, which is where we really get into the meat of like, we've now done this A to B testing. So the findings that came back from this, for example, we had the shelf variant resulted in a medium increase of 22% of plays resulting in a click compared to the overlay variant. So we had, we had an effect. We increased our click rate by 22%. The caveat with this though is it's a percentage of a percentage because remember how I said earlier when we are showing an example of our roadmap. We were testing this against 10 publishers, 50% of those publishers, users, essentially. And to dig in more into the details that, is, that I won't really have here is that five of those publishers came back to us with no statistical significance. So you really have to think about like, what are you working with? What are you expecting in terms of success for an A-B test? We're okay with this. 22% of our percentage of what we test against, that's good. That means that we're going to trend upward in terms of this being a successful feature that we can put out there. 
So the bigger picture here is this means that design can effectively and quickly move the needle on strategic business goals. So that's how you get there. That's how you get from, we have an idea. We have a design team that's capable. We have front end engineers that are capable. We have a data science team that's at our disposal. They want to be doing this. They love the data, obviously. Our product manager's behind this 100%. And then we're able to show that it can move the needle and actually inc increase click rates, which, again, when I'm talking to my CEO, that makes a massive difference. So lastly, before you, we wrap up here, as you pursue a data-driven design process, make sure to have guiding principles. These are really important. Love having them internally in our design team. Aim for optimization rather than perfection. So understand that perfection is unattainable. Just accept it. You want to continuously optimize for your users. You don't want to be striving for perfection. You want to put something out, get it out fast, understand what it means to your users, get that data, and then keep iterating. It's a constant iteration loop. Then you want to, let's push innovation with big ideas that data can measure. Think big, let, like, go crazy. I want, like, I want my designers to think crazy and have the data rein them in and tell them, okay, that wasn't, that, that wasn't such a great idea. We had a crazy idea, didn't work, but it's okay. So really, when you're in this world of data-driven design, you're really striving for innovation, but you have to really push yourself there. Don't limit yourself. And then validate without a bias for the answer. This is so important. I won't pretend that we've worked with product managers that are so sure about what the outcome is going to be that you almost wonder if the data comes back and it's not going to validate it, are they actually going to let it die? And that's something that with design internally in our team, we don't have a bias for what we're designing. We want to put out a solution and we want it to be the best solution for our users. We're okay with it being a bad design. We're okay with the failure, but you really have to have everybody on board with that. And then the very, very last one before we go here is don't test without a reason to test. This is really important. If you're testing without a reason, without a hypothesis, you're testing, there's no problem to solve. You need to ha make sure that you have a problem that you're solving so that you're optimizing for your users at every point. So that's all I got. Monica, thank you very much. And I already see a hand up. Hi there. Hello. Uh, thanks for the presentation. So quick question, having really big ideas uh, and testing them and then relying on data to figure out what to do uh, sounds like an awesome process. I was wondering if you could give like a few great tips when you have to try and sell these tests to publishers. So some of your tests may not perform very well um, and you're kind of playing in their sandbox, not necessarily yours. Yeah, that's actually a really good question. So for us, what that means is, you know, when we reach out to publishers and we really want to get them to let us A-B test against their user base, we have to understand what their strategic goals are. Uh, so we have our own internal, because we know how we really want to push our business, but how do they want to push their business? If they don't care about user engagement or recommendations driving more plays for them, then they're not going to be a good test subject for us. We're not going to get their buy-in. So we, we do really like to have conversations direct with our customer base and then kind of keep them involved in the process of our product development and see, you know, as we're we're trying to pursue other products that might not be anything related to this business strategy, what, what might they actually care about? Do they care about, they want to be able to customize our player, do they want to be able to have a better experience with multiple players on a page? It's a really case-by-case -case basis that it's something that we do have to consider. We are playing in their sandbox, we do need their permission <laughs> to give the right user, the right experience to the users that they have. Does that help? Probably time for one more. Hi, my name is Ken. So I have a question about the dream team. Like we have four like, kind of departments that are working on together. Yeah. But I have a question about like what kind of ideal background for a person who's going to be 
your quality gatekeeper? Oh, for QA. Yeah. So for us, our QA, our QA means literally our QA team. So there, uh, there are test engineers that are embedded directly with our engineering team. So they are actually somebody that we have a really great partnership with um, in our workflow at JW Player. They are the ones that essentially, when we build a product and it, and it hits their queue where they're validating whether this can pass the test or not, they're validating whether it actually looks like our design and it's the experience that we've created for them. So they're, very, they're engineers, they're test engineers, they really have a, a really high standard for what will make it out to our users in terms of breaking the experience, introducing bugs, you know, just being over, overly mindful for what we're actually trying to release to the player. Awesome. Monica, thank you so much. That was fantastic.